What do you think is the biggest challenge facing uh, traumatic brain injury uh, sufferers or their families mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. friends right now mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed? In my opinion, uh, I believe it's lack of awareness. I still do believe that we could really um, go much, much farther. Just had an interesting day in, here in Albany last week and um, heard from a lot of individuals, family members, survivors, even assembly, you know, assembly men and women, um, that just still are surprised to hear that this program exists. I think going back to your point, Joe, the, the subtle nature of some TBIs and the fact that I think the statistics show that, you know, at about close to two million a year, Americans are, you know, suffer traumatic brain injury and about 1.3, the ones that don't result in fatalities or, or other, um, 1.3 million are released from the emergency room and who knows where those individuals go. Um, I think there is a tendency to, um, kind of downplay the severity of those um, limitations. And so I think individuals try their hardest to go about their normal routine, and that's where you get into um, the societal issues where someone may be um, categorized as having a mental illness or a developmental disability and not. So it's really just a lack of awareness, I think, overall, um, that needs to just, can, we need to continue to strive to um, speak about the availability of these services and also about the, the complexity and the subtlety of, of TBI in general. We were talking um, before going on the air today that um, if we went back 50, mm -hmm. 60, 70 years ago, uh, people with traumatic brain injury and the way we in the United States and our society were handling it, mm -hmm. it's not really something that we ought to brag about. Mm -hmm. Would you talk about mm -hmm. that a little? Um, I can a little bit, Joe. Yeah, it is, uh, it is rather sad. Um, I'm glad to say that um, that has changed. I think that's the important part. But, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, what was happening, at least in New York State, is people were being um, institutionalized outside of New York State for lack of the support services here. Um, and again, that was costing the state money and also it was, you know, made it extra difficult for family members and survivors. Um, also, when you're out of state, mm -hmm. New York State lost control. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And all those those factors. So that's that's changed. And with the inception of this program, that's part of one of the goals was to be begin to bring those people back in and integrate them back and really give them a choice of where they want to live and who they want to live with. Um, nationally, again, I think your first point, Joe, about um, the subtlety of you know the the undiagnosed individuals and the people that I think would be would be quick to be categorized into this individual has a developmental disability or a mental illness, where really that's not in fact the case. Um, but things like, again, the impulse control, um, physical impairments, mobility impairments um, can be, I think, misunderstood by society at large. So that is a good point. It's not a developmental disability. It's something that is a result of an injury. Um, it's not a really a mental illness, although it can um, have similar symptoms as well. <clears throat> Basically what you're saying is uh, you and I in five minutes could take some sort of an action which would instantly <clears throat> result in our having a, a traumatic brain injury. It comes mm -hmm. on that suddenly. Absolutely. From what I understand, it, it, I should say it can come on that suddenly. Again, I think it really just depends on the nature of the injury, what part of the brain was injured, um, the individual themselves. I mean, I have heard some really fascinating um, you know, research and seminars from neurologists and stuff that really talk about even how personality and values and upbringing can all contribute to what the same injury with one person, you know, the impairments or the disabilities that result with another person. So um, it's really hard to say, but certainly again, a concussion, you know, right away in the next few days. I mean, I don't know if you're aware of the, the new initiative about the, the high school athletics and the 24 hour mandatory kind of wait period. Yes. So that's another thing where, you know, it can be um, a delayed onset or it can be, you know, an immediate manifestation. So When our son was mm -hmm. in high school, mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't let him play football. And he was very, very mad at us. Yeah. Well, in latter mm -hmm. years, he said, thank you, Mom, thank mm -hmm. you, Dad, because all of uh, his friends that did play high school mm -hmm. football now have all of these knee injuries. Right. And right. you're hearing now mm -hmm. about... Uh, Athletes, whether it be football or boxing or uh, maybe basketball falling, mm -hmm. are beginning to suffer uh, traumatic mm -hmm. brain injuries or heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Is this something mm -hmm. that's always been going on and because of today's uh, the web and mm -hmm. social networking mm -hmm. we're more aware of, or is this something new? Yeah, I, I'm sure it has been, been, Joe, and I think that's a great point that the awareness is starting to you know, take place. Um, you know, especially in high school sports, which is a kind of what this, this main new initiative that New York State's doing, you know, there's, um, 
these these guys, these young guys, are you know they're animals. They're gung ho, and they haven't been fully trained on how to hit correctly and so forth. So there is, you know, a, a greater probability of concussion. Um, there's some staggering stats I was looking at the other day. Um, something like 47 percent of high school football players at least suffer a concussion at some point in their career, which I think is pretty remarkable. Not not all those concussions will result in you know a brain injury, um, but certainly it is something that happens. I think. You know, quite often. You uh, have been very optimistic mm -hmm. uh, in New York State. You see, legislatively, uh, mm -hmm. without getting too specific, because mm -hmm. things are still going on. Sure. Some good things happening for mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. those that suffer from traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that a little? Absolutely. I I have to commend you know our, our governor Cuomo and the right. new commissioner Shaw. Um, I think they're doing a great job. I think there's some hard decisions to be made. And again, I won't get into it in much detail. But one positive thing is it looks like um, is that again I think statewide people are gravitating toward this home and community-based model. Again, because of the, um, you know, the less expensive nature of these services and also um, really just the, the dignity, I believe, of these individuals and, and promoting the choice. So there's a recent thing, uh, the Community First Choice Option, I believe, um, recent movement. I, I don't know that it's been signed by Governor Cuomo, but certainly it's in process right now. And that's really the same kind of thing, Joe. It's you know promoting more of a, more availability to the home and community-based programs. One of the uh, greatest <laughs> contributions I think um, Governor Cuomo has uh, made to uh, New York State uh, since he assumed mm -hmm. office this year is he's made people feel good about living in the state again mm -hmm. and that's a big intangible. Mm -hmm. What do you think about mm -hmm. that? I do. I mean I, I've always loved New York. I was born and raised here and lived lived elsewhere. Um, I think it, there needs to be some vision. I think, you know, in years past, and I think all of us are, are guilty of it, you know, it can be discouraging as we see we're bombarded with the messages of, you know, pessimism and, you know, with the reality, really. And I think, again, that, um, from what I've heard and what I know of him, which is not much, that he's really, Governor Cuomo has been really passionate about making the hard decisions to ensure that the state be, you know turns a corner so to speak and begins a new direction so. but also he you can tell he loves the job but he loves the yeah. state which that yeah. that makes everybody uh, feel good yeah. Yeah. Uh, for viewers that might need your mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. I know you uh, mentioned the near the, go to sure. the near state uh, web health site do you mm -hmm. have a a more personal contact number. Yeah, or absolutely. They can give you a call and service. Any viewer, by the way, certainly, um, I would welcome the call personally. Again, Aaron Harris at Elder Choice. Uh, our phone number is three one five two five two seven eight eight nine, and I certainly can um, track down the numbers for the Albany and the Buffalo region RDCs, and can make referrals to uh, the Southern Tier. We serve the Binghamton Southern Tier region as well, all the way down to Broome County, and so they all have their own kind of centers for referrals, and would be happy to support any survivor family member absolutely